All right, guys. Um, how many of you have played uh, Pac-Man before? Uh, almost everyone. And how many of you consider yourselves as uh, good Pac-Man players? So we have a couple of liars in the room. That's good to know. Um, we, we, we play a lot of Pac-Man, but we're pretty bad at it. And we saw an opportunity using reinforcement learning to make an agent that plays Pac-Man. And uh, voila, this uh, workshop was, uh, was born. Welcome to reinforcement learning, Pac-Man. So before we continue, I would like to get to know you guys just a little bit. Since we're at the university, I'm going to assume that there are going to be students here. Hands in the air if you were a student. A few students. And the rest of you are uh, IT professionals, I'm going to assume. Sounds good. So we're a diverse set of people. That is great. So let's begin. Now, this was originally a three to four hour long workshop uh, where we would present some theory about a couple of reinforcement learning methods before we would let the participants uh, work on some tasks and play around, do some coding, and train uh, an agent to play the classic game of Pac-Man. Now, we don't, do not have much, that much time today, so we're going to do uh, things a little bit differently than how we usually do this. So we're going to present the same kind of theory, uh, but the format is going to be more like a walkthrough, where we kind of do the workshop on screen in front of you. Uh, but we have also made the material available, so we will give you access to the environment where you can code as well, so that you can follow along and code if you want to. But this is, of course, not uh, necessary if you just want to sit back and watch us do the work on screen. So let's take a look at the agenda of the day. <clears throat> We will start out with a brief introduction to reinforcement learning, explaining terminology and concepts with a few examples. And then we will begin um, uh, doing, uh, we'll start building the first reinforcement learning model based on something called Q-learning, which we will also explain uh, how that works. And then the second model we will build will be based on deep Q-learning which means Q-learning with neural networks. So I don't know how many of you have worked with neural networks before, so we're going to at least do a, a small refresher going through the basics so that you understand what we're working on. Before we begin, let us tell you guys a little bit ourselves. Yes, uh, my name is, my name is uh, Malta. I am from Denmark. Uh, I'm currently working at the Nordic Consultancy firm called Knowit. It's uh, originally from Sweden, but they have uh, bought up some other companies in Oslo, so we're sitting in Oslo in Norway. Uh, I've been working there for two and a half years now, and I started working there directly after I graduated. Uh, I did my master's at the Nor Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and during that time I also did one year at UCSB in Santa Barbara here, California. Um, I did it um, focusing on computer science and artificial intelligence, my master's. Uh, right now, I'm on a project at V, which is the Norwegian railroad company, where we are a little team that sets the prices for the tickets. So if you guys go to Norway and you think it's very, very expensive with the tickets, you know how to blame. It's me. Um, and we used a bit of machine learning there to predict how many tickets we're going to sell, so we can adjust the prices accordingly. All right. My name is uh, Manu, and uh, I'm from Norway. Uh, for the past few years, I've been actually following basically the same path as uh, Malta. Uh, we used to study together at the Norwegian University of Technology, and we also I, also, I was also at UCSB for a year. And now I also work at the same firm as he does, know it. Uh, currently, I'm outsourced to a company called Antud which is uh, Norwegian for one trip. It's a government-owned company in Norway, and their mission is to collect all the sales and ticketing solutions for public transportation in Norway, making it possible to travel anywhere in Norway using just one single app, basically. So it's pretty cool. And before that, I did my master's thesis within uh, machine learning, doing natural language processing on tweets to uh, predict the gender of authors.
That's you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. OK, um, so how many of you guys work with uh, machine learning in your daily life? Oh, quite a bit, actually. That's cool. And how many of you work with reinforcement learning? Not so many. How many of you have uh, worked a little bit on, on hobby basis with reinforcement learning? Anyone? Yeah, a couple. OK, so we'll go through all the basics then. Um, so machine learning is a branch of uh, AI. And AI is a kind of a broad topic, which means to make the computer do something intelligent. And that's the, also the goal with machine learning, but machine learning has two additional properties, namely that the, uh, it uses data to train its models, and it's not explicitly programmed to solve one single problem. So for instance, a neural network learns solely based on the data fed to it, and therefore it can kind of solve uh, any problem based on this data. Um, yes. And one thing that's also, so machine learning is also divided into three parts, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Manu is going to talk a little bit about that uh, later. Um, but one important thing to notice is that reinforcement learning, it creates its data on the fly, while usually supervised learning and unsupervised already have pre-created data sets. So let's talk a little bit about uh, reinforcement learning. Um, recent year, reinforcement learning has really like taken off. There's a lot of hype about it. All kind of started back in 2013, I believe, when Google DeepMind made uh, a bot that plays Atari with the superhuman performance. And from there, it just took off. Then they made Alpha Zero, which beats the world best players in chess, shogi, and go. Then OpenAI 5 made uh, a reinforcement learning system that beat the world's best players in Dota 2, and then Google DeepMind again made uh, AlphaStar, which beat the world best players in StarCraft 2. Uh, but reinforcement learning is not only used in games. Uh, the games are merely a, a stepping stone before entering the real world, and it has been used in the real, real world to control traffic signals. It's been used to predict financial markets. It's used in medicine and also to accelerate human learning. <laughs> uh, yes, so there are kind of five terms we need to know before we start going deeper into the material. The first one is agent. And an agent is a unit that performs actions. So for instance, it could be a drone making a delivery, or it could be Super Mario navigating a video game. Um, the second term is action. And the action is uh, something that the agent does. For instance, in Super Mario, he can run to the left, he can run to the right, he can jump, and so on. Uh, the third term is the environment. And it is the world where the agent moves. Uh, for instance, in Super Mario, the environment is just a complete game, right? In real world, the environment is the laws of physics and society that deems whether your actions are, are good or bad. Then there is the state, which is a concrete and immediate situation uh, where the agent finds itself and puts it in relation to enemies and rewards and stuff. It's very often a function of time. So you can think about it as if you stop the time, you're in a given state. I'm going to give you a couple of examples later. And then lastly, we have the rewards, which is the feedback what, that we measure our success or failure uh, of our agent, agent's actions. Uh, so for instance, in a video game, when Mario touches a coin or he wins the game, he gets a good reward. But when he dies, he probably gets a negative reward or a punishment. So we can kind of look, look at it with this figure. If we start on the left, you have a state and a reward. This is fed to the agent. And the agent then performs an action in the state, the action is performed into the environment, and the environment returns the reward and the next state for that. And then this loop continues until an episode is terminate. It's terminated. So let's just look at an example. Here is the Super Mario walking around. We have stopped the time, just took a screenshot. It's, he's in, currently in this given state. Um, and when he's in that state, he has gotten a reward. 
and he knows which state he's in. So now it's time to pick his action. Uh, if you guys can see it, I'm going to go to the next state. Now he chooses to go to the right. So action is to walk to the right. This is the first state. This is the next one. Just walks to the right. The environment then gives back the next state and a reward. The reward here is probably just nothing because nothing really happened. And so on continues until he either, until Mario dies or uh, he wins the level. Um, there are a couple of challenges of reinforcement learning. The two biggest ones are the exploration versus exploitation challenge. And the second one is delayed or future rewards. Um, so for the first one, I'm going to use my puppy as an example. So this summer I got a puppy. It's a golden retriever. If you, any dog people here? Um, and you can think of him as kind of an agent that tries to maximize his own rewards. And what you need to know is that I live on the th in an apartment on the third floor. So when you go out of my apartment, you go down the hallway and you reach the, the ground level, you have to open a door and then you can either walk to the left or walk to the right. And if you walk to the left, you walk to the backyard. And if you walk to the right, you go out on the street. So when he was uh, very little, we just took him to the backyard all the time. So we walked to the left. And now, when we then open the door, he only walks to the left because he knows there's the backyard and he really likes to sit there and chew on his sticks in the backyard. And that's what kind of what puppies do. They always just try to exploit exploit every situation, choose the best reward on a very short-sighted notice. And so for him to know that walking to the right is also good, we have to show him that. So we showed him, and he also, it, uh, he also likes to, to walk out on the street on a walk. Um, so the way you solve this is that if you only choose the path that gives you the max reward in a short term, then your agent is not going to learn to search the whole state space. So this is often solved by just by a small random probability, you perform a random action. So that when, for instance, a puppy walks to the left, at some point there's going to be a small probability that he's also going to be walk to the right, and he's going to look at the right path, and then he'll look at all the rewards over there, and then he can make a better choice later when he is fully trained. Yeah. Um, the second one, the delayed rewards or future rewards, is that when you tell him to get down, um, you give a treat because he did something that is correct. And the reward is associated with good behavior. Now, if you wait too long to give the treat, he might, for instance, have laid down and then, for instance, look to the left. And if you give the treat after you look to the left, then he's going to think that it was because he looked to the left that made him, uh, that was the good behavior. So now every time when you say down, he'll just get down and then he'll look to the left and then you give the treat and that's wrong. Um, <laughs> so he'll also just start walking around, just suddenly look to the left as if he's gonna get a treat then. But um, this is only one example and there's uh, many others. Uh, it can be very difficult for an agent in a video game to learn that something you did very early in the game uh, maybe won you the game like 100,000 time steps later. And this is one a challenge you have to, to take care of. And then we can go over to Q learning. So hopefully you now have a basic understanding about what reinforcement learning is about. And the first model we're going to build will be based on something called Q-learning. So what is Q-learning? It's an algorithm which learns Q values for state action pairs in the environment. Now, what does that mean? Well, for each possible state, you have a set of possible actions. And for each of these actions, it will learn a Q value. A Q value is a measure of utility or quality of an action in a given state. It's a measure of how good it is. So the higher it is, the better. You can view it as an estimate of the amount of total reward that is possible to obtain in the end by picking this action now in this state. So in more practical terms, 
it's a way of uh, measuring how happy will this action ac actually make you in the end. So when you have a fully trained Q learning model, the agent will perform the action with the highest Q value. So let's take a look at a practical example. Now let's say that you find yourself at the Pi Data Conference, and that smiley face right there, that's you in state zero. Now after a long day at the conference, you're looking forward to getting to maybe the Staples Center in state eight because there's a Lakers game or you know, Trevor Noah is doing a show, or maybe it's Snoop Dogg, whatever is your thing. You're looking forward to getting there and, have a, and having a cold beer or something. Now let's assume that you've never been to Los Angeles before, so you don't, and you don't have a map either, so you're going to roam around these squares until you find the place. Now to be able to learn from your mistakes and also your correct decisions, we need a measure for success, and that's what rewards are for, right? So what kind of rewards do we have here? Let's say that if you get to the stable center, that's 20 points. And then on the way there, you could end up at Havlin Race. We just heard about Havlin Race, and people told us that you get the best wings around there. And uh, so we're really looking forward to that. If you guys disagree, you guys got to find us after the tutorial so that we can talk about where to find the best wings. Anyway, Havlin Race, five points, right? You can also end up in the river. And that's not a good idea. That's minus 20 points because winter is coming and it's, it's getting colder. Actually, it's not really that cold here in LA compared to back home where it's freezing right now. But uh, anyway, um, you also have a move penalty of minus one. And we need this because let's say you're really thirsty, so you really want that beer. So you want to get to the stable center as fast as possible. If you don't have a move penalty, you might just you know, take a walk and spend too much time getting there. So this is like a motivation for that. And also because practice makes perfect, you will try to find the stable center multiple times, many times. And each try is called an episode. Now squares four and eight, they're called terminal states. This is where an episode ends, and then you start again, a new episode. Now we need to keep track of these Q values. They're gonna change during training. We need a way to keep track of them. So we're gonna do this by using a dictionary. So for each state and for each action, there will be a value in the dictionary. So in the beginning, this dictionary is going to be empty, meaning that the Q values are all initialized to zero. So we don't really know anything about them. And then following an execution of an action, the Q value for the state needs to be updated with the new information gained in the next state, right? So when I say the next state, it means that you pick an action which you perform in this state, like go left, and then you end up in the next state, right? And there, there will be some kind of reward, and you need to update the Q values using this information. And we will do this using this complicated looking formula, which isn't really that complicated. We just gotta break it apart just a little bit so that we understand what we're facing here. So essentially we just take the old Q value for the state action pair, and then we add the reward that we received in the next state. So if you end up at Howlin Race, you get five points. That's a reward there. Then you also add the estimate of optimal future value, which is a fancy way of saying, take the highest Q value in the next state, because that is the action that is going to make you the most happy from the next state, right? And then you also subtract the old Q value. In the formula, you also see a couple of constant factors. Uh, that's the alpha and the gamma, also known as the learning rate and the discount factor. Uh, if you worked with machine learning before, you've probably seen the learning rate before, uh, perhaps not the discount factor. Uh, this is used to scale down the Q value for the next state. We do this because we value the immediate reward received now more than the potential reward that we might receive later on. So the five points for Howling Race, that just we just add that instantaneously, but we scale down that maximum Q value that we pick from the next state. 
The learning rate is a scaling factor used to scale down the entire update value. So during training, we want to update the Q values iteratively and slowly so that we can gradually close in on the optimal Q values. So if, you, if we do not scale down, the Q values may change too much at each step, and the model wouldn't, wouldn't learn anything useful. So this is very usual to do in machine learning, which you probably already know. So let's do a test run, right? So in the beginning, there are two possibilities, right? From state zero, you could go to either state one or state three, right? So in the beginning, since the all, all of the Q values are all zero, you're just going to pick a random action. So let's say we end up in state three, and now we need to update the Q value for picking state three from state zero. So we'll just use this formula, and it's all about plotting in the values that we already know. And we have to set a discount factor and also a learning rate. These are parameters that you usually tune during machine learning training. And this is the same formula, just that now we have plotted in the variables for the update step that we're about to do. So the new Q value is going to be you take the old Q value of zero, then you add the learning rate multiplied by the reward received, which is minus one in state three because nothing really happened there, so there's just a move penalty, plus the discount factor multiplied by the maximum Q value in state three, which is the state you ended up in, and this is also zero at this point, and then you subtract the old Q value, which is also zero. And then you get a new Q value of minus 0 0.2. So we update the dictionary, and then it kind of makes sense that the Q value is negative at this point because nothing good has really happened yet, right? So if we continue and do and move on to state six, then we see that uh, the action of going to state six from state three, it's a positive Q value because something positive happened, right? And then we can just continue. You move on to state seven, we update the Q value, and then at some point we'll end up in a terminal state. And you see that there's a massive boost in the Q value for going to state eight from state seven because the reward in state eight is so huge compared to the ones we've had before. And since we're at the terminal state now, the episode is done and then we start a new episode. And this time we might end up here because now the Q value for going to state one is actually larger than the Q value for going to state three because going to state three is now minus 0 0.2 while going to state one is zero, which is higher, right? Then we might end up in the river and then the episode is done. And this goes on. This goes on until the algorithm converges on the optimal values to a point where the path from the university to the stable center is so clear, right? And the, when the path doesn't change anymore, then the model has converged. This is just the algorithm which just defines everything I just talked about. We're not really going to go through that because I already did, but I just want to make a few points. This step is called exploration, which Malta already talked about. For some random probability, there is a likelihood that we're just going to pick a random action no matter the Q values, no matter how good they are. And otherwise, we will exploit the knowledge that we already possess and we'll choose the action with the highest Q value for the state we're in. And why do we do this? Well, if you look here, there are actually two paths to the terminal state, right? You could go through state three, six, and seven, or you can go through one, two, and five. And obviously, it's better to go through state six, where you'll get chicken wings on the way, right? Because if you go through one, two, and five, you'll end up at the stable center really hungry, and it's not the best path. It's actually a suboptimal path right here. So it's, it'll, it will take you to where you want to go, but this way is better. And if you don't explore, you might not find this path. 
With that said, I think we're going to start doing some coding. So we're going to use Python. Um, and later, we're, all, we're also going to use Keras and TensorFlow uh, for the deep Q part. Um, TensorFlow, you some of you have probably used it before, Google's deep learning framework. Keras is a wrapper around that to make it a little bit more user friendly. Now, for the coding part, there are actually two parts. Uh, the first part is done using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, how, many, how many have you used Jupyter before? Base, almost all of you, that's great. So you know that it's an online interface for working with the code and, and running it and all that. We will use this to write the implementation and train the models using the GPU in the cloud. And you will also be able to do this while I'm doing it because we'll give you access to the interface through this URL, which you can all uh, go to right now. And using uh, the username written on that piece of paper that is so nicely cut out for you, uh, you can uh, uh, log in on your separate users. The password is AI is cool. And you'll get your own copy of the, the notebooks. So I'll just give you like 15 seconds to do that. <laughs> Um, in the second part, we will uh, watch the trained model play Pac-Man, but we will have to do this locally on our machines because, um, well, we haven't made the, the, the GUI available through Jupyter. So we'll have to download the trained model and then we'll run it locally, uh, which is uh, from this GitHub project. So if you've set it up beforehand, that's great. Um, and if not, and if you're not able to do it now, then uh, we're going to leave all this open for the rest of the day, I guess, uh, so that you can play around with it later as well if, you, if you'd like to do that. And otherwise, you can just sit back and watch, watch the show. Everyone got the screen? All right. So if you log in, you'll end up in this screen. And then the, the folder you're going to use is called ML Pac-Man Jupyter. You'll just get in there. And then you'll see all these notebooks. And uh, you also, you'll also see some py Python files. And th those are just like helper methods and stuff that we'll use in the notebooks. And uh, we've also bundled the Pac-Man game, which a buddy of ours at work uh, created. He created like his own version because he wanted to try out the graphical stuff. So we just bundled that in a notebook as well, but we're mostly going to be working on the assi assignment files. I'm just going to show you what, what it looks like, like the game, um, before we start. Because it doesn't look like normal Pac-Man. For some reason, he didn't, he didn't create it that way. <laughs> is everyone able to see, or is it like, is it? Is it possible to like, dim the light here? Or? Uh, so this is what the Pac-Man game looks like. It's basically you know, the same game. It just uh, doesn't, doesn't have like, a yellow guy running around. Um, we're going to do a deep, let's, let's look at the, the, the map we're actually going to train on for the Q-learning model. It's going to be a little bit smaller, because Q-learning is very sensitive uh, to the size of state space, so basically the size of the map. So this is a much smaller map. We're going to create a model for that. All right, let's get back to uh, OK, so most of you have already worked with uh, notebooks before. So sorry? Do I need to zoom? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> is that good? All right. So notebooks, you probably know how it works. Uh, you have these code cells that we can run. 
then the star shows up here, it means that it's running, and then when that number shows up, it means that it's done executing the code within the cell. So in this cell, we're just importing packages that we need for the rest of this assignment. The first thing we're going to do is define the rewards for each of the events that can occur uh, while playing Pac-Man. So the values for these rewards is all about, it's about trying different values and then seeing if it works. It's like hyperparameters that you tune, right? Um, the important thing here is that you want to balance uh, the values in relation to each other, right? You need to somehow represent the importance of each event and how much they mean. So we're not going to, going to do any experimentation right now. I'm just going to plot in the values that uh, we've found uh, beforehand that seem to work all right. So when you pick up a dot, you'll get reward of two. And then if you were captured by a ghost, that's a bad thing, minus five. If nothing happens, meaning that you just move and you don't pick up a dot, you just actually just move uh, in the game, then it's basically a move penalty here of minus 0 0.1. And then if you crash into a wall, it's basically the same as not doing anything. If you win, we need to boost the rewards to represent the significance of this. So we give that a 20. If you lose, let's say minus 10, right? And then we shift enter to run the cell. And then we just move on. We initialize the Q table here uh, to an empty dictionary. And then while training, we will populate the dictionary with the states and the Q values for the actions um, as we train. So most, uh, many of these methods have, we have already implemented fully uh, because there's a lot of just procedure. So I'm just going to explain them and then we'll move on and do uh, the, most of the coding will be on the actual uh, machine learning aspects. So this method is just for picking the optimal action given a state. So the optimal action for a state You'll find that by looking up the state in the Q table, and then you find the action with the highest Q value, right? But picking an action itself for each state you're in is not about just picking the most optimal action. You will also have to have this exploration probability, right? So for so we will set this to 0.2. So that means there's a 20% chance that you will disregard the Q values and you're just going to uh, pick a random action and see where it gets you. So for a, random, for a certain probability, there's a likelihood of picking a random action. So we'll get all the actions. and then we'll return a random action. Otherwise, we'll exploit our, the knowledge in our Q table or Q dictionary, and then we'll just use the, uh, the function that's already defined above. like this. And this method just picks the maximum Q value uh, for a given state. We're going to use it uh, later on in the training function. So we, now we've basically defined all the functions that are needed to train a Q learning model. So the training function, it has two arguments here, uh, the level, the map that we're going to train on, and the number of episodes that we want to train for. So we begin by initializing the game state to the starting point, and then we need to 
uh, define the gamma and the alpha. The, the gamma is the same as the discount. We'll just set it to 0 0.8. And the alpha will set to 0 0.2. And for each episode, we need to do a certain number of steps. So each st episode uh, starts at the starting point, right? So we will just initialize the game state. And then we need to pick an action given the game state, the current game state. So pick action. And then we will use this helper method from the Pac-Man game package, which given the current game state and the action that you decide to execute, you will get the new game state and also the event that occurs uh, uh, when you perform that action. So if you won because you picked up all the dots, or if you lose because you lost all your lives as the ghosts captured you, then the episode is done and it will move on to the next episode, right? Uh, we need to calculate the reward given the action event, which we'll do like this. This is the method that we uh, defined in the very beginning. And then we have to um, define the update step. We need to implement the Q value update step, which is based on this function, right? Which I explained earlier. So what we do is we take the old Q value, and then we add the learning rate, which is defined as alpha, I believe, multiplied by the reward that we received plus the discount factor times the maximum Q value in the next state, the new game state. So we will use this method. Compute, I think it's called compute max Q value, okay. It's a new game state, all right. Minus the old Q value. Now this could have been written a lot more cleanly with variables and stuff, but this is not a clean code tutorial, so I guess we're fine. Um, and then we're, we're basically done and we can run this cell and see if it is able to execute fine. Looks like it. This part? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's basically the same as the, the, first, uh, the first part here. And then we will just try it out. We'll train for 250 episodes. So we're just we're just uh, we're just doing some printouts here to see that it's actually able to learn, and we can actually see that it's learning more and more for each uh, for as the number of iterations increase. Two hundred fifty episodes doesn't take that much time, so uh, it's done training, and the model is now stored in the file called QTable in the same folder. And what we can do now is we can download this file. And then we'll move on to the other project. And inside the package called Jupyter, where we basically bundled everything that's going on uh, in the rest of the uh, project, we bundled everything we need in here instead. And we go into the Jupyter main file. And then what you can do is you can like drag uh, the, the file inside the Jupyter uh, package, which I've already done, so I'm not going to do that again now. Um, and then we can run the, the game and see how it performs. 
And we only ran it for, OK, that's the wrong, uh, wrong Python file. Uh, we only ran it for 250 episodes, which is not that much. So here we see that it's actually doing quite fine. That's interesting. <laughs> it was supposed to be really bad. OK, let's run it again. You can just put it in the Jupyter package right here. Just drag it in here. Just put it in that folder? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because the path is already defined in the Jupyter main uh, um, uh, file. So can you the Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the bottom, you can uh, comment in the play Q learning model sure. instead of. Uh, Instead. I'm going to download the model I just trained because maybe the model I have in my package is a little bit better than I thought it was. Sorry? In my terminal? I didn't go in my terminal. Do you mean like in here? Or oh, like in the IDA? Um, I, oh yeah, I just no, I just uh, I just used a hotkey for running the the file, but you can just like right click on Jupyter main and then run it and then it will actually run. Yeah. So, we're going to try this again and see what happens. Okay, now it's, okay. Okay, when I ran this at home, it was really bad. And I was going to make a point out of, oh, you got to train it more, you know, for uh, like 5,000 episodes. <laughs> but now it seems like it's uh, actually doing pretty well. So I think we can just move on to uh, the next part, which will be about deep, uh, deep Q learning, where we will be able to run, uh, like train a model for uh, bigger maps. Because Q learning is actually, uh, um, it's very sensitive to the size of the state space. So for bigger maps, uh, it will be really hard to train. It will take a long time. And deep Q learning is less sensitive towards this. So for the deep Q learning model, we will be able to run uh, and watch it play on that bigger map that I showed you earlier. But in general, the point I was trying to make is that um, uh, if you only train it for a few iterations, then it's not going to be as good as if you train it for a longer time, especially when the problem becomes very complex and the map is more difficult, then you have to train it for a longer time to get uh, a good result. Before we get to the deep Q learning part, uh, um, I'm just going to, I need to change my display here, sorry. Before we get to the deep Q learning part, uh, I'm going to briefly talk about supervised learning because there is an aspect of supervised learning in, uh, in the deep Q learning, even though it's different from reinforcement learning in general. But uh, there are a lot of people who had already worked with uh, machine learning before, so how many of you have worked with supervised learning? Okay, there's a fraction of people here. Uh, I'm just going to explain very briefly, not too many details, but just like the main idea here. So supervised learning is used for predictive modeling. Given a set of input features, you want to predict a certain outcome. Now there are many different algorithms which differ in their approaches to learning, but they all have in common that they intend to learn a target function, f of x, which can map input variables x to an output y. This function is based on examples from the domain you want to predict. And the first step in supervised learning concerns the data. It's basically the first step in most machine learning uh, uh, methods, I guess. 
to train a supervised learning model, you need a data set of examples from the problem space that you're trying to predict, right? So say you want to predict the market value of cars, right? Then you need a data set describing different individual cars through a structured representation. And this representation could be the make, model, mileage, and the year of the car. You could use this to describe one instance of a car, right? Additionally, each data sample also needs to be labeled. What was each car actually sold for, right? And that's why it's called supervised learning, because you act as a guide or a teacher for the algorithm by providing the answers to each example. Now, it's common to say that the more examples that you have in your data set, the better. Uh, but I'd like to say that what's most important is that the data set covers the problem space as much as possible, which means that, you know, this often implies that uh, the more data you have, the more likely you are to cover the problem space. Next, the training set is fed to the learning algorithm. Based on the examples of the cars and the correct labels, the algorithm tries to capture uh, patterns and approximate that function of predicting the market price of cars. Now, our goal by doing all this is for the model to generalize the problem of predict predicting the market price of cars so that you can predict the market price of any car, cars that the model hasn't seen before. That's the whole point of this, right? That's very briefly supervised learning. Let's talk about, about artificial neural networks, which we're going to use for uh, deep Q learning. We've been hearing a lot about it lately. You know, so you got all these big companies uh, doing all this crazy stuff with neural networks, image recognition, speech recognition. You have grandmasters of chess being beaten by machines. It's pretty cool. Today we're going to use this for uh, Pac-Man. How many of you have worked with neural networks previously? There are some of you, okay. I'm not going to go into like grand details, not like technical details, but just like the basic stuff to understand what a neural network actually does. I thought I'd break down the black box of neural networks with some simple examples. Now this can be viewed as a very simple neural network. We only have one input variable, the engine power of the car, and then you have an output of price um, as the output. Uh, and then that circle in the middle there, that's a neuron. Naturally, neural networks consist of neurons, you know, following that an analogy of how neurons in the human brain process information. Now, this neuron executes some kind of function on the engine power to predict the price. Let's expand this a little bit further. Now, we could say that the engine power and the weight of a car could say something useful about the speed of a car, right? Like if the car is heavy, then it's going to be slower. And if uh, the engine power is greater, then it's going to be faster, right? So we could say that the speed is an inferred abstraction from the engine power and the weight. Furthermore, given the seat fabric and the amount of leg space in a car, we could say that uh, we could say something about the level of comfort that a car provides. Now these two inferences are high level abstractions that a network may be able to learn. If we put all this together, we get a neural network with multiple layers. Through multiple layers, a neural network has the potential to learn the relationships between inputs in one layer and then infer high level abstractions that it can pass on to the next layer. So given these four input variables, the network may be able to infer information about the level of comfort and the speed of car, which again may narrow down the um, task of predicting the price of a car. This is the input layer. The number of neurons in the input layer directly corresponds to the number of features used to uh, represent a data sample in your data set. So here we have four in features, so we have four neurons. The number of neurons in the output layer uh, depends on the problem that you're trying to solve 
So this is essentially a regression problem uh, where you have a continuous numerical value uh, as output representing the price. But when we're going to use this for uh, Pac-Man, then we're trying to predict the uh, action that you want to execute given a state. And in Pac-Man, you have four possible uh, actions, which are the directions that you want to move. Uh, so you will have four output neurons representing these four classes of actions, right? This is the hidden layer. This is essentially where the magic happens. A neural network can have an arbitrary number of hidden layers. It can also have an arbitrary number of neurons in the hidden layers. Uh, and these are parameters that you want to try out different values for to find the most optimal uh, architecture for your problem. Now, the reason why it's called a hidden layer is that because in reality, it looks more like this. Because the high-level abstractions that it learns are not visible to us. We can just hypothesize about what it learns. We don't really know what's going on in here, which is also why we have to make this illustration a little bit more complicated. Since we don't know what kind of concepts the network learns, we just feed all the neurons in each layer, every neuron in the previous layer. And then we just cross our fingers, and then we hope that, please learn something to solve my problem, right? I think I'll give this to you now so that you can talk about deep Q learning. Um, so why is deep Q learning really a thing? Uh, why do you use neural networks for this? Uh, the reason is uh, memory requirement. If you have a Q table, your memory requirement is an array of states times actions. Uh, for instance, with a state space of five, you have five different states you can be in, and an action space of two, which means you have two actions to pick from. The total memory consumption is 2 times 5, which is 10. Um, the problem here is that, for instance, chess has a state space of around 10 to the power of 120, which means that this uh, spreadsheet approach with the Q tables uh, doesn't really scale into the real world. Um, but we can steal a trick from the media compression world, which is trade some accuracy for memory. Uh, because storing a video, a 1080p video, at 60 FPS um, per second takes about one gigabyte with lossless compression. And if you add some loss in, then you can take the hit with the accuracy, and because it's still going to be good enough, right? And it's going to be usually, or at least in DeepMind's uh, opinion, it's going to be better than humans and that's going to make a data scientist smile. Um, so you can see here, this kind of looks like the other figure I showed you guys. Uh, you have the environment on the right. It gives a state and reward to the agent. The agent does take that state and the reward, and it uses the neural network. It maps the state into the input layer of the neural network, and it finds a policy, which means it finds the optimal action to make in that state, and then it takes that action into the environment, and then it goes on. Pretty similar to the Q table approach. Uh, there's a couple of things we need to do when we introduce neural networks, though. Uh, one thing we can do is make the update function uh, a lot more uh, simple, because uh, the learning rate is no longer needed, because the back backpropagation optimizer already have that in neural networks. So the learning rate is simply like a global gas pedal, and one does not need uh, two of these. Uh, once the learning rate is removed, you realize that you also can remove the two uh, Q terms because they cancel, cancel each other out. And then you're just stuck with the reward plus the discount times the maximum Q value in the next state. And so let's simpler uh, this formula. Uh, another thing you need to do is, uh, I mentioned briefly, to map the state into, a, uh, into the input layer of neural networks, because neural networks, they don't take strings. They only use numbers. So you need to map a state to uh, a number or a, um, a vector of numbers or an array. And for this, you can use one-hot encoding. How many of you guys are familiar with, with one-hot encoding? 
Okay, so almost everyone, I'm still gonna explain it to those who don't know what it is. Um, so one hot encoding is usually used on categorical values. We can use this example. We have three colors. We have red, green, and blue, right? So you can't just put those strings into a neural network because it needs numbers. So what you could do then is to assign an integer for each of these categories. So red, you can give one, for instance. Green becomes two, and blue becomes three. Now the problem there is that when you feed this to a neural network, everyone here agrees that three is bigger than one, right? So you're kind of telling the neural network that blue is bigger than red, which doesn't really make any sense. So what you do is that you assign a vector instead of an integer. And these vectors, uh, the example you can see here, the red then becomes one, zero, zero, green can be zero, zero, one, and the blue can be zero, one, zero. Um, the length of these vectors are the same, and therefore the neural network doesn't see any value greater than the other, it just sees it at different values. Uh, this we're using to map the state of the Pac-Man into an uh, input to the neural network. And you can see here, I don't know if you, all, all of you can see it, I'll show it in better detail later. Um, but basically we take the string, we have a string representation of the state, and then you just start at the top left uh, of the state and you just walk through it. You make a, an empty string, or an empty, uh, empty array, I mean, not empty string, and then you just go through each character and you just add this one hot encoding. And what it's gonna look like is something like this. <clears throat> the state is the down to the left here. That's the start state in level zero. When you use this one hot encoding, it's gonna be this long uh, array of just numbers. But this is a unique res representation of that state. So a neural network, when it gets fed this into the input layer, it's gonna know, okay, we're talking about this state now. And then, uh, yeah, it can, it can differentiate between different states. Uh, what the neural network then does is that uh, given this input array, it can then return to us a Q value of all four actions in that state. So the actions here, there's uh, four uh, float numbers here, as you can see. The left, the first item in the list is the Q value for moving left, and then it's up and right and down. So the best action here is uh, gonna be the first item, which is gonna be moved to the left. So if you exploit here, then the agent is gonna move to the left. Mm -hmm. uh, we also need to introduce something called experience replay. So instead of training online, we save an experience to a memory bank, and then we train on random samples from the memory bank. Uh, online training is what we do with the Q value. The agent performs an action. This is immediately updated in the Q table, and then you do the next action, and so on. But what we want to do instead with neural networks and deep Q learning is that when, a, when the agent uh, performs an action, you don't immediately update the Q value and, and train the neural network, but instead you save it to a memory bank and then you draw random samples from this memory bank. The reason for this, there's three reasons. The first one is that deep Q neural networks, they tend to forget early runs. So if the agent, uh, the Pac-Man agent, um, starts to uh, train on a specific level, then after solving, like getting halfway through the level, it'll start train on the later part of the, of the level, right? And then, if you just update the Q value continuously, then it might forget the first part of the level, and then when its uh, episode ends and it's supposed to know the first part, it doesn't know it anymore. So that's why we need to sample from this bank so it can take random, random experiences from it. Um, it's also a really efficient use of, uh, of previous experience because it can learn each uh, move multiple times. Uh, this is key when gaining, for instance, real-world experience is costly, and you can get the full use of it by training multiple times. The Q learning updates are incremental, and they don't converge too quickly. 
Um, so multiple passes with the same data is kind of beneficial. Um, it also reduces correlation between experiences. It's not that great if the neural network learned that certain states follow certain previous states based on an action performed in previous states. It's not really wanted because the world is not really deterministic. For instance, in Pac-Man, the goals, they don't take the same action in every state. They can do some random actions. So you don't want to learn a correlation between certain states. OK. And with that, I think we can go over to the next coding uh, challenge here. Let's see. All right, it looks pretty good. Um, if you guys didn't uh, follow on assignment one, it's fine. Uh, you can ask us later if you want to uh, continue with it. There's also the assignment one answers notebook uh, right underneath it, which gives us what we just coded in. Um, we're going to go to assignment two now. Uh, yeah. If you can turn off the lights again, whoever did that, that would be nice. I can see that the mic doesn't really get my voice before I like bow down, but I hope everyone could hear me. <laughs> I don't think it doesn't work too well. <laughs> but uh, that's fine. Huh? That's good. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I think it's necessary for the stream to work clear. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry? The next door mic is working. Oh, yeah, the next door's mic is working uh, really well. Uh, <laughs> all right, cool. So let's uh, start with the deep Q learning method. <clears throat> um, as Manu previously said, the first cell is just to import uh, packages. Uh, there's one thing you guys should know about this, and it's that the Jupyter Notebooks, the VM that it's running on, it has two GPUs connected to it uh, with 12 gigabyte of RAM each. Um, previously, when we held this workshop, we ran out of memory and everything just crashed. So we added this. Everyone here can use 2% of the GPU memory. Uh, but we are a lot of people here today, more than expected. So uh, we'll see what happens if everyone gets on. Uh, that should be fine. Um, so don't, don't change this uh, number up here too much. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, yeah. Secondly, we're using Keras, as um, Minu said. It's a really high-level wrapper around uh, neural networks that, if you're new, you definitely recommend doing that. Uh, TensorFlow 2 just came out, and it also has Keras built in. And I barely tried it, but it seems to work uh, pretty well. Uh, again, you run the cell by pressing Shift-Enter. There's nothing to do in the first cell. And the second cell, we define all the rewards. Uh, we're going to use some slightly different rewards. It's also, there's two things to think about when you do the rewards. Manu mentioned one of them, which is that you have to make sure that the relationship between the values uh, are coherent or make sense. And the other one is that the values shouldn't get too uh, verbose or too big or too high. For instance, I wouldn't recommend putting anything in here that gives a larger reward than 20, or anything that gets uh, less or more punishment than minus 20. So try to keep it in 20 minus 20 distance. Uh, also, these values are just values that we have experimented with, and it worked pretty well. Uh, but they are not the optimal values. So if you guys want to try to do this yourselves, um, there are definitely better rewards than this. But I'm going to give one for getting a dot, and then minus five to if you're captured by a ghost. And then the none and wall, I'm going to give minus 0.1. Again, just to move penalty, like Manu uh, briefly explained. If you don't want the Pac-Man to run around in circles, getting zero points, and then go to the end, you want him to reach the finish as fast as possible. I'm going to give 10 for winning. 
and then I'm going to give minus 10 for losing. Oops. <clears throat> yeah, and these are not optimal. If you guys want to try, you can just put in some other values. It might work better than what we have. Um, so here is the um, state to input of the neural network uh, mapping function. It gets the string representation from the state. It makes an empty array, and then it just loops through the whole uh, string and makes this one-hot encoding of the state. There's nothing to do there. Then we have to define the model. Um, so one thing that's kind of important that Manu also brief briefly mentioned is that the input size of the neural network, it depends on the size of the state, right? Because if you have a bigger, bigger state, when you loop over it, then you will have a longer vector, and then you will have a bigger input layer. Um, so we're just, um, so that's this input size. Can see this input size here determines the, the, the size of the input layer of the neural network. And then we need to find the number of actions because that decides the size of the output layer. So we're going to just do the length of action.get all actions. Can you? No, you cannot. Uh, autocomplete was not here. Um, because as I showed you earlier, the neural network then returns four values, and each of these values are the Q values for moving left, up, right, and down. Um, so we can see here this is the Keras API. We make a sequential model. You add the first hidden layer here, and as you can see, the input layer is kind of embedded into it. So we know that the input shape is uh, the input size, right, that we already uh, defined. Then we have one hidden layer with size 256 neurons. And then we have another hidden layer with size of 128. And then we meet, need to make the output layer, which is also just a dense uh, layer with the size of the number of actions, because we want four, four values. Yes, this should be correct. I can run it. It should give some uh, warnings. That's perfect. Uh, some deprecated values. Yeah, that's fine. Um, OK, then we have made our neural network model with five code lines. It's pretty easy. Um, then we have the pick the optimal action that we also had in the Q, uh, Q table uh, assignment. This time, it just. It predicts just the model, the neural network, to predict uh, which is the better action. There's nothing to do here. And here also, you can change the exploration probability. It's set to 0.2 here as well. Um, one thing that kind of enhances the performance a little bit is to use decaying exploration probability, which means that earlier, early in the training process, you use a really high exploration probability for instance, 50%, so it's going to see a lot of the state space, and it's going to really explore the whole, uh, the whole world. And then as the training goes on, this value gets smaller and smaller. And at the end, there's almost no exploration, but only exploitation. So it really uh, goes in and sees uh, and uses the exploitation, yeah. Right. Yeah, we're just going to set it for 0.2 for now. And there's nothing else to do here. And then this is the experience replay that I mentioned. Uh, we are implementing this with two classes. It's a memory class, which is the memory bank. It holds a lot of experiences. And then there's the experience class here. I'm going to explain that after the memory. Uh, so the memory is a double-ended uh, queue, or a deck. Uh, we set it to a size of 5,000. Um, the important thing to know about this is that as the first 5,000 experiences come in, the order matters. So that when the item number 5,000 or experience number 5,001 comes in, it's the last one that gets popped out. So the older experiences, they're forgotten. So that we keep the relevant ones, that one that we have learned, and pop out the older ones. 
Uh, so we had we have a add method to just add an experience to the memory. We have a get. We have get a mini batch, which we're going to use, which just samples all the random experiences of uh, this batch size. And then we have a get size. Uh, the experience, it contains all the information that we need to train the neural network at one time. So it's gonna, it contains the current state. It contains an action that's performed in that state. It contains the reward you got for that action. And it contains the next state that the environment uh, returned. And then it's also there's a, a flag here done because we need to know if it's a terminal state or not. I'm going to come back to that. So this is just an experience, and the memory is just a big collection of, this, of these uh, experiences. Uh, I don't think we need to, oh, we don't need to do anything here. OK. So to the uh, training loop where the fun stuff happens, you initialize game state, and you make the memory bank with size 5,000. You can make bigger, too, if you want to. Um, then you start training, pouring through the number of training episodes. Uh, by the way, this game is uh, we, <laughs> a coworker of, of us made it, and it uses, for instance, deep copy method by Python, and that's a really slow method. So this game is not optimized for using for machine learning because it's really slow, uh, but it works. It works uh, good enough, as they say. Um, then while the episode is not done, while he's not uh, dead or uh, have won the game, um, you pick an action. You get the next game state and the action event, and the same here as in the assignment one. We need to know if it's a terminal state. Uh, I'm going to come back to that. And when, if we know when this is uh, done, <laughs> then we can calculate the reward. And then we need, instead, now in the queue table assignment, we just, <coughs> in the queue table assignment, we immediately updated the queue value now. But what we're going to do, we're going to make an experience. We're going to add it to the memory bank. And then we're going to get a mini batch from the memory. And then we're going to train it from that. So we store a new experience. We just make a new experience. Um, uh, object where we put in all of these um, parameters here that you use this in the constructor. So we set the current state. Um, oh, one also one <coughs> important thing to notice is that we need to convert the state to the to the input so we can just easily just take experiences from the memory bank and just plug it into um, plug it into the neural network so we're going to convert it before we put it into the experience first uh, I got them current game state all right and just plug in this. The next one is action, I believe, which is just action. And then you have reward, next state, and done. So let's do a reward, next state. We also need to convert this one. Remember that? Next state is called next game state. And then done is done. So we have this new experience. We add it to the memory bank. We already initialized the memory object. So we just use the add function um, and add the experience. And then we get, then we need to get uh, a mini batch from it, which is this one right here. Memory dot get mini batch, and then you need the batch size, but I think it is already created, so we just write this. 
Okay, I think that should be fine. Yeah, we're gonna write batch size equals batch size. That's fine. Okay, um, so now we have gathered the, these experiences from the memory bank, and what happens further down here is that it creates the training data to train the neural network. We make the features, which is the state representation in the vector, and then we made the targets, which are all the actions or the Q values. Um, it's important that you only train one action. You can only train the action that you performed, so you can't train the other three actions. And the reason we need to know if the terminal state is, or if we are in terminal state, is that the, the target value is simply going to become the reward if it's terminal state. If it's not the terminal state, we need to use the Q value update uh, uh, formula. So it's gonna look like this, the reward plus gamma times the maximum Q value of the next state. Yeah, so we have uh, about 10 minutes left, so we have to move on. Um, yeah, then we just update some parameters. We deep copy again, because that's fun. And then we can try to run our training. Or we can run the we can define our training method. And then you can do this. I'm not going to run this one. You guys can run this one if you guys want. You can run here, you chose the number of training episodes. You should probably just start with level zero. Um, and the batch size, we're going to take 100 from the memory bank. I would maybe change this one to something like 32. It's a little bit smaller. It's going to update the neural network more often. It's going to also be slower. Yeah, so let's see how this works out. So I have pre-trained one. Oops. Okay, that worked. So I have pre-trained one. I trained a deep Q network agent on a different level than the level zero we made. That's the one that Manu showed in the start. Um, let's see here if everything is correct. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so I trained it for 5,000 episodes on level two, it's called. It's up in here in, in the boards. Can you see anything? Yeah, 500 is, is fine uh, for now because I'm going to show you guys how the Pac-Man performs at episode number 500 and at 2,500 and at the end at 4,500. I trained this on my GPU at home. I have a GTX Ti 1080. Uh, it's a bit outdated now, and it trained for about 26 hours. Uh, yeah. So let's see if I run this now. So this is after 500 episodes. The Pac-Man has now played the game 500 times, and it does pretty well in the beginning. But as we can see, it's also important to note that these Mushrooms, I don't know how well you guys can see it in the back, but the mushrooms, they make the ghost scared. So if you run into the ghost after you take a mushroom, then the ghost is dying and not yourself. But now you can see we're at the kind of the end game, and the Pac-Man is a little bit confused of where to go because in 500 episodes, it hasn't really reached this far. It has learned the start of the game, and it helps a little bit that the map is quite simple, but here it died three times. So the, ga the game is over. So let's try with 2,500. Let's not try with 2,500 because it's not here. Let's try with 3,000. Uh, so this is after 3,000 games played. Hopefully it should be a little bit better, but it still mostly won't solve the problem. As we'll see. I think I'm regretting a little bit that I made put so many mushrooms in this level because the ghosts are just kind of permanently scared and pretty useless. Um, so you can definitely make a harder board uh, for the Pac-Man. Let's see if he's able to solve it. Now, when they're blue now, 
they can kill the Pac-Man, yeah. When they're kind of like lighter, then Pac-Man can kill them. So it actually managed to win the level here, and it was actually pretty fast. Uh, this probably happens around 50-50, but we can see later on when the training kind of is at its uh, latest stages, the Pac-Man actually becomes pretty smart and will actually run in a straight line to all the dots and be able to solve it pretty quickly. But yeah, now the, the ghosts are like light, light blue slash green. So if they run into Pac-Man now, they're, the ghosts are the one that dies and not the Pac-Man itself. I should not have put this many mushrooms in, in the map. <laughs> so let's see here, it's running away from the ghost. <laughs> if you guys saw that, it's a pretty interesting that also seen is that the ghost was running after the Pac-Man. One more time. The ghost was running after the Pac-Man, and the Pac-Man could have survived. But I think that the Pac-Man had learned that it can just die and use one of its lives, because then it spawns in the middle of the map, and then it's going to be faster to reach the other dots. So it can learn some things like that, too. Um, and it all depends on the relationship between your rewards, because if you really put a heavy punishment in dying, then it won't do that. But if you put kind of a light reward or punishment for dying, then he will, um, there he just, he moved into the ghost and he spawns in the middle and then he runs and solves the problem. So that's pretty fun. You can learn stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so there is uh, seven minutes left. Oh, I have a couple of more slides actually. Okay, so just fast at the very end here before we take some questions. There are some obviously some improvements to this. This is kind of the baseline of DeepQ neural networks. Uh, you can use decaying exploration probability that I uh, mentioned. You can use convolutional layers because convolutional layers, they're really good with the 2D uh, data. So that's why it's all often used on images and stuff. And the Pac-Man game board, it's 2D, so it probably will enhance the performance a little bit. Obviously, more training time, more memory, and more processing power is going to make the training faster and, and converge faster. Um, there's also something called a target, to use something called the target neural network, which um, during training, when you train this network, the Q values, they actually change from the beginning of the training until the end. So they learn different things during the training time, which kind of uh, confuses the neural network a little bit. So you can use two neural networks instead, which means uh, more stable training. And then you can also use something called prioritized experience replay sampling. So instead of taking random experiences from the memory, you can kind of prioritize what kind of experiences you want. Let's say that your agent is struggling uh, earlier in the game, then you can say, oh, okay, well, we, we want to take experiences that happened earlier in the game and then train on those, so uh, the neural network will uh, perform better there. And, uh, yeah, I think that is it for us. We'll take some questions, is, if anyone has. Yeah. Yeah, you? Do you mean the Q table or the deep Q? Yeah. Without using deep neural network, yeah. could you still get this kind of success? Yes. Repeat the question. Yeah, okay, repeat the question. If if they if memory wasn't a constraint, would you guys get the same results on the Q table as we did? Uh, and yes, you would, uh, definitely. Uh, even, even with the constraint, because the GPU constraints are not applied on the assignment one, so that, um, the Q table, the assignment one, you, you can definitely, with what we just did now, you can definitely get the same results, yeah, if you, if you plot in the same, yeah, on the Jupiter. In, in, on the Q table, it's, it's pretty fast because we only use it on the level zero, right? It's the, easiest, it's the easiest map because it doesn't really scale to bigger maps. So on the easy map, on the level zero map, uh, you, it, will, it will converge and it will work pretty well.
Yeah. All, all yes. Yes. Um, so the question is, why don't Q-learning take longer to train? Because in Q-learning, you have to search the state space, while in the neural network, in deep Q-learning, you don't have to search the whole state space. Um, and the answer to that, do you have any good answer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm thinking about it. Um, the, as the, question, the, the problem is that on the Q-table uh, version of this, um, we, we can't make bigger maps because then, then it won't, uh, like it won't scale, right? Because you have to hold the whole Q table in memory at the same time. Yeah. And if memory wasn't a constraint, let's yeah, let's yeah say if, we can. if you can, <laughs> then <laughs> I mean, sure. Then it would converge too at some point, but you would also need to explore all the states, right? To get the optimal solution. Because the update st step itself is the same for both methods. Kind of. Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, we can, <laughs> not uh, sure about it. <laughs> we can uh, we can talk later if you want to after the after the session. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, you know, that RNP produces uh, different algorithms and uh, rules, right? or you could use social networks. So typing, for instance, um, can you give me an example of society principles? Um, I mean, if, um, okay, so let's say you're the agent yourself. Repeat and you, Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. The question is, uh, I said that if you're the agent, then the environment is kind of the laws of physics and the rules of society. And if I can get a, an example of that. So an example could be um, you yourself are an agent and you jump out of uh, a window on the third floor then you're going to hurt yourself because of the laws of physics. And that is kind of a punishment reward from the environment, from the, from the laws of physics. And in the rules of society example, for instance, if you go out and uh, hit someone in the face, your pro police is probably going to come and maybe arrest you or something. And that's uh, a punishment from the, from the society that you shouldn't run around and pun punch people in the face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You had yeah. a question as well? Um, so can you make Q values change over time? And when would that be applicable? During training that you will learn different values? Like if the or Q value changes during the gameplay, like as you take more and more steps, like the, the Q value of a certain action increases or decreases. You mean um, like the rewards, if they increase and decrease? Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Are they um, time during gameplay? Oof. Uh, that's so a good question. Okay, so you're wondering if the rewards could like change during training, because the Q values they do change, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Like, the set rewards can they vary? It's an interesting thought. It's an interesting thought. I have not tried that myself. Um, it would also be pretty weird because if you change the rewards, then kind of everything you trained up to that point would be a little bit useless. Yeah, because it depends on like why would you want to change them, right? There should be like a reason to change them, like. Like maybe the the reward is like this reward is less important. Like this event is less important at some point. Then it makes sense to change them, right? But like picking up a dot and not dying in Pac-Man, it's equally important the whole way, right? So it doesn't kind of make sense to change them. But like in other applications, then maybe. Yeah, I've never tried it. Yeah, for instance, that could be a way to go. At different levels in Pac-Man, you can change the reward for each level because some level maybe you need it to be a high reward for picking up a dot or else the agent won't converge that fast. Yeah, that could be a thing. Thank you for the questions. I think we're out of time, right? I have one more. Or one more. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, there's a nod. <laughs> we'll take that. It can get stuck. Yeah, it, can. it can get stuck. But usually, as long as your rewards is like thought out and you, 
use the two rules that we talked about, then it will often uh, converge to a, to a good solution. Yeah. Yeah. I think. They will not necessarily do the same solution, no. I believe, at least, yeah. Yeah, we just based all of this on observation, but but I mean, if you were going to do this properly, you would use like statistic methods to like kind of measure uh, how successful you are, right? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. If you guys uh, want to ask us anything else, you guys can just find us after, uh, like right now, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thank you. <laughs>